and then we'll stand and sing hymn 250, All Creatures of Our God and King, of which we'll sing the first four verses and the last.
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. A welcome to you all this morning to this Eucharist on the sixth Sunday of Easter, and a special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. This morning there's a slight change in uh, the receiving of communion. There is no screen, but that don't come too close. <laughs> but come to your usual place, please. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Together we pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and... Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Let us therefore rejoice by putting away all malice and evil and confessing our sins with a sincere and true heart. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour. Lord, have mercy. Christ have, Christ, have Lord, have Lord, have mercy. May the God of love and power forgive you and free you from your sins, heal and strengthen you by his Spirit, and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God, our Redeemer, you have delivered us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your Son. 
Grant that as by his death he has recalled us to life, so by his continual presence in us he may raise us to eternal joy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. This is the Gospel of the Lord. The 
to remain standing, let us pray. Lord God and Heavenly Father, have mercy upon me, your unworthy servant, upon us all your servants, that by the power of your Holy Spirit you would break open the word in Scripture and wing it to our hearts, that we may give ourselves to you in glad obedience and in love for you and for Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Oh, give me some peace. How often have you found yourself saying that? Oh, please, give me some peace. We live in a world, don't we, with communities in conflict with each other. Many lives are so stressful, and technology seems to have increased this rather than lessened it. Too often our lives seem to be driven by emails, 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 and computer says no, with the message, as I got in Tesco yesterday, unexpected item in bagging area. Don't many of us echo John Whittier's prayer, take from our souls the strain and stress, and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace? Jesus, however, in his farewell speech to his disciples, made it clear that his gift of peace was not peace as the world gives. Jesus' peace is not merely an absence of noise, stress and conflict, but is, in the Hebrew tradition of shalom, a peace which is health, contentment and well-being. Don't we all want that? It seems also that there is a link between the peace which Jesus gives and the quality of our relationship with him and our obedience to him. He said in this morning's Gospel, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching, and my Father will love him and will come to him and make our home with him. What sublime intimacy! God! Father, Son, and Holy Spirit comes to make our home with us, his children. It is the role of the Holy Spirit who indwells every believer to make this happen, to dwell in us, to teach us all things, and remind us of everything that Jesus said, so that we may know what to do and how to respond to him in loving obedience. Now the reward of living in an intimate relationship of daily communion with him in trust and obedience is peace. Peace. What a privilege. When I was about 14, I know that's perhaps difficult to imagine, when I was about 14, I recall one afternoon at school, a middle-aged lady supply teacher came to teach us RE. <coughs> For some mad, obscure reason, she decided to lecture us about the missionary journeys of St. Paul. Well, you can imagine how that went down with a bunch of indifferent adolescents, can't you? And I'm ashamed to say that while I wasn't disruptive, I was never disruptive, I wasn't exactly overflowing with enthusiasm and didn't take it seriously. But now I rather wish I had, for there are real gems of insight in the story. In our first reading, Paul and his companions were travelling on his second missionary journey. Now, I get very irritated with the lectionary because he's actually missed out some of the most important verses. But just before the passage we heard, we, 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 uh, we had read, Paul had left Syria and moved northwest into what is now central Turkey. He attempted to turn right and go northwards towards the Black Sea, towards the region on the coast there. But, Luke tells us, the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them. The Spirit of Jesus would not allow them. Paul was listening. So bypassing those regions, they went straight ahead to Troas, which is on the coast of the Aegean Sea. And in Troas one night, 
Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia, which is now modern-day Greece, begging him to come over the water to help them. Paul obeyed the vision from God. Just as well, for had he not, Europe might never have heard the gospel. It would have stayed in Asia. Paul was already open to God. He was listening, open to the voice of Jesus and ready to do his will and not his own. Why was Paul so open to the voice of Jesus right then? Because Paul already had an, had an intimate relationship in prayer with the living Jesus Christ. By daily communion with him, he was practiced in recognizing Jesus' voice and could recognize the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Friends, we are able to do the same. Simply by making space to spend time with Jesus in prayer, in reading our Bibles each day. Do we realize the great privilege of being invited into an intimate relationship with the Father and the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, I know prayer can be hard work, I find it hard work, and it may mean that we have to be disciplined, but it brings the richest rewards. So if we're looking for somewhere to begin, then why not read a passage of Scripture each day? Go through one of the Gospels, take a short passage and read it through. Start in Mark or in Luke. Perhaps use some notes to help, and the clergy will be pleased to suggest good ones. Or why not join a small group of us, clergy and lay, who meet, meet each morning for morning prayer to say the office on Zoom, online. Because Paul was so accustomed to hearing Jesus' voice, he was obedient, ready to forgo his own ideas, to change his own plans. And as he obeyed, so he knew God's great shalom peace, the peace that passes all understanding. Peace, contentment, health and well-being. Yes, even in the face of possible conflict. So are we listening to God? How open are we to changing our little plans? Following this service, we'll be holding our annual church meeting, at which we'll celebrate and give thanks for all that's been achieved and for the blessings that God has showered upon us in the past year. We'll also look to the future at the opportunities and challenges that lie ahead, knowing with joy that under God's direction and in his power, so much more can and will be accomplished for his glory. His glory. Someone once said, if you want to give God a good laugh, try and telling him the plans for the rest of your life. Might I suggest the same applies to the church? Those standing for election as church wardens, as members of the PCC and Deanery Synod, as well as those who elect them, need to be prayerfully open to the prompting and leading of God's Spirit. For, like St. Paul, who was a man with feet of clay. We have feet of clay. We can all have our own ideas, pet projects and agendas. But at the end, what matters is that God's will is done. Like St Paul, we may need to let, be able to let go of these and choose God's path instead. Or to put it another way, we should not be asking God to bless our little plans, but to ask him what he wants of us. Clergy and lay folk in most churches across the land and across the world invest so much of their time, energy and interest, and indeed of themselves, in church activities. And friends, that is appreciated and welcomed but for some people, and it is a minority, 
their sphere of church work can become their private possession, their own preserve or domain. An empire, a petty empire to be defended at all costs. And when this happens, the effect on the worship and mission of the church is disastrous. Surely this would never happen at St Paul's. No. When I was collated and instituted as vicar here, the archdeacon placed my hand on the handle of the church door at the back and I was given the key, symbolic of the legal possession of the benefice with its rights and responsibilities. So legally the church, in one sense, belongs to the vicar. But actually I am very clear that while I as incumbent the vicar is called to lead, the church does not belong to me. Neither does it belong to anyone else. This is God's church, not ours. It is God's church, not ours. So as God's beloved children, may we simply abide in him, in Jesus. May we eschew every distraction every vanity that would assert itself above his will. And then might we be faithful in discerning and listening to his voice, to be obedient to Jesus above all else. May we be faithful in doing his will rather than our own. For therein lies the secret of our peace. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would enable us to make you Lord and King of our lives. Lord and King of this, the Church. that we may know your peace. Breathe through the heats of our desire, thy coolness and thy balm. Let sense be done, let flesh retire. Speak through the earthquake, wind and fire, O still small voice of calm. Amen. If you are able, please stand as we declare together our faith in God. <clears throat> we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that's seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, <clears throat> God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. 
On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who spake only the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Hear our prayer. We pray for the Queen as she approaches this very special time in her life. We give thanks for all her hard work and we bring before you all members of her family who love her, support her, and care for her. We pray for those who govern the country that they may receive wisdom and guidance. <coughs> Hear our prayer. We remember the people of Ukraine who are suffering so badly. We ask that those who are finding a new life in other countries will find peace and comfort in their new homes with new friends and people who will care for them. We pray that those left behind will find peace and refuge and that the Russian leaders Hear our prayer. We are aware that today our annual parochial church meeting takes place. We give thanks to all those who have served the church during the last year and before. And we pray for those who are preparing to stand for membership this year. We give you thanks for all the hard work and dedication given by doctors, nurses, scientists, and all the ancillary staff who look after patients, those who keep the hospitals clean, and all our ambulance drivers. We bring before you all who are ill and sick, and those who are worried about the future. We remember those of our friends and relatives who are ill, especially Darren Mills and Hazel Seifert. Calm them with your love. Make your presence felt and bring them peace. We give thanks for the lives of Andrew Langford, Doreen Smith, Phyllis Stephen, and Ivor and Adrian Grice Samson. And we remember and bring before you at their year's mind Edward Young. Catherine Fosher and Betty Valentine. May they all rest in peace. Amen. 
and rise in glory. Be our strength in hours of weakness. In our wanderings, be our guide. Through endeavour, failure, danger, Father, be thou at our side. Merciful Father, I accept, accept these, these prayers, prayers for, for the, the sake, sake of, of your, your Son, Son our, our Saviour, Saviour Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. If you're able, would you please stand for the peace? <laughs> when they saw the Lord. Hallelujah. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere to give you thanks, almighty and eternal Father. And in these days of Easter, to celebrate with joyful hearts the memory of your wonderful works. For by the mystery of his passion, Jesus Christ, your risen Son, has conquered the powers of death and hell and restored in men and women the image of your glory. He has placed them once more in paradise and opened to them the gate of life eternal. And so in the joy of this Passover, earth and heaven resound with gladness, while angels and archangels and the powers of all creation sing forever the hymn of your glory. Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. So Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. As we offer you our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup so that we in the company of Blessed Mary, St. Paul, Alban, Paul, and all the faithful departed may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ, our Lord. By whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, 
with all who stand before you in earth and heaven. We worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Most merciful Lord, your love.
pray. <clears throat> God, our Redeemer, you have delivered us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your Son. Grant that as by his death he has recalled us to life, so by his continual presence in us, he may raise us to eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, The Lord be with you. And also with you. May the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, come down upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. <laughs>
speaking and our praying. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your loving graciousness to us in all that you pour upon us in blessing and goodness. We thank you for each other, for the gift that each of us are to each other. We pray you will give us love for one another, love in our speaking and our acting and our thinking, love for the people beyond these walls whom you have called us to serve. So come upon us now, Father God, we pray in the power of your Holy Spirit and lead us with good humour and love. In the name, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning. It is still morning, just, everybody. Lovely to see you. <clears throat> As I said, this is, these are, it's not one meeting, it's two meetings. So we're, we'll start with the um, meeting for the election of church wardens. <clears throat> I hope everybody's read the minutes of the last meeting at which we elected two church wardens. That was the only business conducted at that meeting. And everybody's happy with that. It's an accurate record, yes? Yes, good, okay. And we now come to the election of two church wardens. I just want to say, for, I won't say too much now because I will say a bit more in my address in the next meeting, but I want to say for myself and on behalf of us all, a huge thanks to Alison and to Florence for all that they are and all that they do. We have two fabulous wardens, absolutely fabulous wardens, who really care for each and every one of you, and they also care for me which apparently is their first duty, to care for the vicar. And they do quite a good job. So I'm really grateful. Alison and Florence, you have our sincere thanks. Um, you have nobly offered to stand for election again. And <clears throat> Florence has been proposed by Brian Taylor and seconded by Malcolm Smith. And Alison Philipson has been proposed by Tom Otley and seconded by Claire Price. And so all we have to do is to vote yay or nay for Alison or Florence. I think we might do this on block. Those in favour, please. <laughs> Anyone against? No! Unanimously elected. Alison and Florence, please come and take your seats. Yes. Pat has produced a form for me, a crib sheet here, and it says, unanimous, yes or no. And I've just put, why, why, unanimous. It's brilliant, and that's a resounding affirmation, I hope, Alison and Florence, of you, and of the work, and, and, and the appreciation that we have for you. <clears throat> we now close this meeting, that particular meeting, that's ended. The second meeting is the annual meet parochial church meeting, and this is, um, um, Anybody who's on the electoral roll of the parish may attend and vote. So this is um, what's going to happen. We're going to start. Now, I have, uh, you might like to know that I have not been notified of any other urgent business and urgent items, item seven at all. Nothing under item seven. So when we get to item seven, we'll move straight to item six, to item eight, sorry. Do we have any apologies? Item one, do we have any apologies for absence, please, Pat? Yeah, apologies, <coughs> excuse me, apologies from Jane Stevenson, <laughs> sorry, Kath Unwin, Rachel Clover and Rita Brayton, and particularly R Rita has said that she is praying for us. That's sweet, thank you, a lovely of her. <coughs> Good, okay, thank you. Item number two, we need to agree as a correct record, the minutes of the APCM held on 9th of May 2021, which have already been circulated. I hope everyone's read them before, because I don't intend to spend lots of time doing this now. Give a moment. Right, are we happy to receive those? Could I have a proposal for these minutes, please? Val Lane, seconded by Claire. All those in favour, please. Oh, it doesn't look too many. Could you put your hand up very clearly so I can see? All those in favour, thank you. And um, those, any, any against, not happy? No. I think that's unanimous. Well done, thank you. 
<clears throat> we need to elect parochial representatives of the mayor, which is the PCC, um, six representatives for a three-year term. This is under item number three, and I will ask Pat to explain how we're going to do that and the caveat we've got. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So we have six so um, places, and we have two nominations to vote on today. Um, Al Lane, <coughs> proposer Brian Joliffe, and seconder Yvonne White, and Linda Byer, <coughs> proposer Alison Philipson, and seconder Florence Bignall. Thank you. Do you want to say something about the other people? Yeah, okay. okay. Sorry, She's got the microphone. Yes. That's the same as again. Nomination, Valerie Lane, proposer Brian Joliffe and seconder Yvonne White. Nomination, Linda Byer, proposer Alison Philipson and seconder Florence Bignall. So it's Valerie and Linda who are standing. Are there any offers to stand for PCC? There are six places, all told. I know we can always co-opt, but it's much better if we're able to elect at this meeting. No? Okay. In which case, um, we'll move to, if you'd we, if we like to do this on block, you're happy to do that? Yes? Okay. I propose, uh, these are proposed. All those in favour of Valerie Lane and Linda Byer becoming members of the PCC, please show. <clears throat> Thank you. Any against? Unanimously carried. Thank you very much indeed. Item number four, we now come to elect two deanery synod representatives for a three-year term. Actually rather important. So um, we have, please, sorry, um, my phone. Nomination for Malcolm Smith, the proposer is Sheila Smith and the seconder is Alison Philipson. Okay, so that's Malcolm. Any other offers? We do need someone else to stand for deanery synod. when all the eyes hit the carpet. <laughs> okay, well, something we'll simply elect Malcolm in that case, if people are happy to do that. Okay, all those in favour of electing Malcolm, please, to Deanery Synod. Thank you, Pichot, thank you. Any no's? No's, no, okay. And no abstentions, okay, fine, thank you. So, Malcolm, you are elected, thank you very much. But, and indeed, to Valerie and Linda. <clears throat> we need to appoint a dependent examiner, Colin Airy, of George Hay Chartered Accountants. David, do you want to speak to that at all? Um, not particularly. They were actually come, come, to, come to the microphone. Yep. <clears throat> the examiners were actually appointed last year from the previous examiners. Feedback there, right? <laughs> okay. Well, okay, well, thank you, David, very much indeed. So, um, we probably do need to approve those anyway, don't yeah. we? It would be a good idea to do Okay, can I, David, would you like to propose? Uh, maybe, yes, and who would like to second that, please? Colin Avery. Thank you, Cliff. All in favour, please. Thank you very much. Any against? No, that's all carried. Thank you. <clears throat> to receive the reports. To report on changes in the electoral roll since the 2021 APCM. Mark, would you like to speak to this? Do come to the to the front. There haven't been many major changes since last year. Um, a bit of up and down because of people dropping off and a couple of other people coming on. So we have 108 people in total. 19 people are in the parish and 89 from outside. Thank you very much, Malcolm. <clears throat> Thank you. We now go on to 6B, an annual report of the proceedings of the Parochial Church Council and the activities of the parish generally, as already exhibited in church, and you have received copies of these, I think. Um, I will allow questions if there are any questions. 
but I will address, be addressing everybody about referring to the report in, in what I say a bit later. But it's, I, I, can I thank everybody who's, who's, who's um, uh, helped to compile this report, particularly Pat, who's worked so hard on this, and a number of other people who have contributed to it. So that, you know, if I can record my thanks formally, please. Um, it is a labour of love and much appreciated. <coughs> No questions. Okay, let's move on. <coughs> um, we move on to the statements. The financial statements of the Council for the year ending on the 31st of December 2021, as already given, exhibited in church. Um, David, do you want to say something about this? It might be helpful if you could just sort of introduce those. It's just <coughs> to say that the accounts haven't been independently examined as yet, They're, that's in process. So we have to accept those as draft accounts. Um, and the only other thing I want to say is thank you so much to Cliff for actually preparing them. <laughs> but, um, they are available for, for everybody to look at and, and we should get the, uh, the approval of the independent examiners very shortly and then we can lodge those with the charity commission and Thing. Did you want to just say something about the financial state of the church? Anything that would be helpful to Well, support? the financial state of the church really is, as I listed in, in here, I'm sort of reading through reading it all again. Time. I think, in summary, we can say that we're really quite fortunate as to how well we're doing, bearing in mind what's gone on in the last couple of years. And that's largely due to some very generous donations from individuals and, and for of them. the stewardship campaign which people increase their giving um, so really we've got a lot to be thankful for that, that we are in the situation we are given what we and many others have had to go through um, looking to the future I think uh, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel in many ways that with the big proviso the, the cost of fuel mm. which is uh, going to be everybody's problem isn't it and inflation generally, <laughs> so we should probably be back in November at stewardship of somebody asking you for more. It's probably fair to say that actually we're not paying our full whack towards um, we're to not. the diocese, and I think no. we need to, to bear that in mind, that we owe the diocese money in order to, 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 to sustain the ministry. Short shortfall last year was about £18,000. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're not alone in this. Um, I think every church in the deanery is, is short paying and obviously the diocese understand the problems but we really, really need to aim to, to get back and pay our full, full share again that's got to be one of our objectives thank, thank you very much on. thank you very much indeed thank you um, okay if there are no questions can we um, approve those please as draft accounts you want to have to oppose them David yeah. and Andrew Gray will second them. Those in favour, please, please show. Thank you very much indeed. Any problems? Any want to show against? No. Okay, thank you very much indeed for those. We now move on to 6D, the budget for 2021 as approved of the PCC as already exhibited. <clears throat> Does anybody, has anybody any, any questions over that on those? No? In which case we'll move to proposing and seconding and voting on them. Okay, can I have a proposal for those please, the budget? Okay, Malcolm, seconded by, can I have a seconder for the budget please? Uh, David, those in favour please, show. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Report on the fabric goods and ornaments of the church of the parish as exhibited in church in the annual report. Um, does anyone have any questions, or do the wardens like want to speak to this at all? Florence, do you want to speak at all to this? I don't really want to answer you, that's um, just one or two things. Uh, obviously, since I wrote the report, some of the fabric issues have moved forward, but I think we'll, you'll hear about that later in the Vickers and my report. Um, what I would really like to do is thank the Fabric Committee who have been so supportive over the last year. It's been a very, very busy year and I'm very grateful to them for all their help and support and especially to Claire who's 
secretary and keeps me on the straight and narrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Florence. So, uh, are there any questions? No? Nope. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. We don't need to vote on that, do we? No. A report on the proceedings of the Deanery Synod as exhibited in church in the annual report. Wendy, do come speak. Nice to have some, somebody else speaking rather than me. Thank you. And before I welcome Malcolm, I'd like to say a big thank you to both Tom and to James Beecham, who have been my colleagues up until now, uh, but they've had to stand down, Tom because he's doing his reader training, and James because he's very much involved in the Church of the Transfig. So thank you to both of those, they've been a great help and support in teaching me what Deanery Synod was all about. I hope I can now welcome Malcolm, it's lovely to have you volunteering for this role, I think you did, I don't think your arm was twisted too badly, but um, I hope you'll enjoy it. As I said in the little blurb I wrote, it's a good opportunity to be very nosy about what other people are doing in the deanery. Um, you've got the report and you'll see that we had a variety of meetings over the last year. Some have been via Zoom and some have been in face, at face to face. And that's, that's much better because apart from anything else, you get a cup of coffee made for you. Um, the, the format of Deanery Synod meetings are, they start with a business meeting and then you go on to one or two presentations by people from other churches and that's when you really get an opportunity to find out the other things that are going on. Uh, this week we had a, a presentation by David White who's the diocesan secretary. Uh, so we learned a little bit about what a diocesan secretary does and what his version what he'd like to see the role changing into. So welcome, Malcolm. Thank you, Tom and James. And anybody else who would like to join us, we still have a vacancy for one. So thank you. Thank you, Wendy, very much indeed. It's very helpful. There is no item seven, so we're going to go on to the Vicar's report. Dear friends, <clears throat> as I look back on the past year, it's with a huge sense of gratitude. It was only this time last year when we were just beginning to recover some semblance of normality. And at that stage, an extended programme of, of recovery lay ahead. As I said in my address to last year's APCM, recovery would involve renewing our personal relationship with God in prayer and worship and with each other, refreshing our vision and sense of purpose, and rebuilding our core worship services and ministries, our teams and finances, and of course our presence in Bedford. A year down the track, it is clear that while we are most definitely in a new normal, much of what we lost during the pandemic has been recovered. Other things have had to wait. Some things may not be recovered. And we have had to learn to be patient with ourselves as well as with each other, and to recognise that it's simply not possible to do everything that we might like to do or for things to happen faster. That, for some of us, has been a hard lesson to learn. Secondly, when I spoke to you all last year, I said that we must put mission at the top of our agenda, especially to find new ways of reaching out to a younger generation while continuing to cherish our more mature and established folk. I added that we must also find ways of keeping our doors open to the lonely and needy in our town centre. I believe it is still true that we may need to be prepared to be radical, but more of that a little later. <clears throat> First of all, I want to say thank you. I wish to express my sincere appreciation to everyone at St Paul's who have done so much both to enable our recovery and move us forward in worship and mission. And, it's, and you've done this, and it's been brilliant. 
My thanks to the clergy and lay members of our ministerial and pastoral teams for their assistance in the leading of worship and the care of church members. I particularly wish to thank Father Luke for his enthusiasm and commitment in supporting our ministry during the COVID pandemic. After a long year with little live music, it had been so good to be able to enjoy the return of our choral tradition. And I thank Ian Runnels, his assistants and the choir for their dedicated hard work. The return of the rich variety of their singing and enhancement of our worship has been an absolute joy. So thank you. I wish to place on record our thanks to Heather Turnham, who stood down from the organisation of the Tuesday concerts last summer. These concerts have now come under the umbrella of Music at St Paul's, which includes the organ recitals, Tuesday concerts, visits from Bedford Music Club and other organisations. I thank Claire Taylor-Price, Alison Philipson, Ian Runnels and Robin Bartslett, who have been the prime movers in revitalising the provision of music outside our services. After a deafening silence in St Paul's Square during the pandemic, the bells are back. But as a sign of the new normal, now ring after the 1015 Sunday service instead of before. The Flower Guild have worked wonders with fewer people to help. The sides people, our servers, sound and video teams have also done splendidly, despite all of them struggling with depleted numbers. I wish to express my personal gratitude to the members of the PCC, it's a fabulous PCC, and the various subcommittees who work so hard, particularly to those who help to maintain a large fabric, and to Pat Witto, our PCC secretary, and David Price, our treasurer, who are doing a fantastic job to keep the governance and finances moving smoothly <coughs> and forward. Standing, of course, in the background is the benign memory of our dear friend, our past treasurer and secretary, Alan Dickinson, whose recent death has been a huge loss, not only to his family, but to all of us at St Paul's. And I think it is important that I take this opportunity to record our immense gratitude <coughs> to him. May he rest in peace and rise in glory. Safeguarding remains my highest pastoral priority as vicar. It has to be. It is essential that we do everything we can to keep others safe, especially children and vulnerable adults, and to keep ourselves safe. That is sometimes forgotten. In view of the Church of England's dreadful track record on safeguarding, there are new requirements for church officers in every church. Church officers is a term which, in this context, means a far broader group of people and includes any of us who inhabit any formal role in the church. Consequently, all of us, in different ways according to our role, need to comply with safeguarding checks and training. Keeping me, and indeed all of us, on track is Sue Gray, our parish safeguarding officer, assisted by Wendy Jones. And I thank Sue especially for her dedication and professionalism and ask that when any of us receive a request to undertake checks or training, that we comply without delay. The office deals with a huge range of demands and is running remarkably efficiently and smoothly with Robin Bartlett, our centre manager at the helm, together with Sharon Evans, our wonderfully efficient administrator, and my PA. She's a joy to work with. And I express my gratitude to them. We should all be aware that, in the wake of the pandemic, they have had to take on roles previously undertaken by volunteers who are no longer available. They are working at full stretch, which is not indefinitely sustainable, and I ask everyone to bear this in mind before making requests. Behind every flourishing church are two steadfast and accomplished church wardens. In particular, I wish to th thank Alison Philipson and Florence Bignall are indefatigable wardens, who not only work tirelessly behind the scenes, but do so with passionate commitment and with love and care for us all. And my job would be impossible without their love and support. So Alison and Florence, I thank you most warmly for all you do for me and for us all at St Paul's. Thank you very much. 
As we now look to the future, we do have some challenges which I'm going to ask us all to face. The face, at first, is resourcing. Resourcing. You will have heard me say before that the pandemic has driven a coach and horses through our church life. Last week's Dean with Synod confirmed that this is the case in so many other churches who, like us, are now worryingly short of volunteers to cover all the bases. Now, if anyone doubts that this is the case at St Paul's, I would remind them of last Sunday's service, where the preacher was also the MC or Master of Ceremonies, and Crucifer and Intercessor. If you had to wear hats for those, he would be extremely busy doing this. Resourcing areas of our church life at St Paul's has become critical, critical. To list just five areas. During the pandemic, our team of around nine servers has shrunk to around five valiant souls and we need to grow the team. Secondly, the Wednesday Eucharist has become increasingly popular, but we really do need volunteers to help the clergy set up for worship. Could you offer help, say, just once a month? Or once every two months? Thirdly, we would not only like to restore, but to expand the opportunities to gather socially, which you will appreciate is a vital part of church life. However, our catering team needs 10 more people to volunteer if this is to happen. Could you offer help? Fourthly, the team who operate the sound system has been cut to the bone, <clears throat> and live streaming the Sunday service is a real challenge. Thanks to Peter this morning. <clears throat> Already, someone will have logged in at home on a Sunday morning to find there is no live stream as no one was available to operate the laptop in, in church. That's someone who's housebound, who can't come to church. Finally, one day we may arrive at church and not even be able to hear the service ourselves because there is no one to operate the system on that day. Could you offer help maybe once a month or once every two months? It's really not difficult and training will be given. Resourcing all these areas is not just for us, for our sake. It is vital for our mission. Over the past few months, the PCC has reviewed and revised our Mission Action Plan, or MAP for short. The Mission Action Plan is not intended to be a dusty museum piece stuck up on a wall, but a living working document with clear aims and objectives and with practical steps to achieve these aims. And we are focusing on five areas, growth, families and children, music, finance and community engagement. I won't go into detail today, but a copy of the map will be on display in the next week or so for everyone to see. Today I simply want to flag up two or three areas, but also to say that we're already making good progress in a number of them. <coughs> First growth. All churches need to grow. St Paul's needs to grow. Not simply to grow the church per se, nor to find people to cover all the bases, although it would help, but because Jesus has commanded us to bring others to know him. We do not recruit in the church. We evangelise. In short, this is not recruitment, but evangelism and mission. Please note that I said evangelism, which is a Catholic word, and not evangelicalism. Please note the difference. There is a clear recognition across the Church of England that we, by which I mean every church, have to grow younger. And while I realise that the style of our worship, which I hasten to add I treasure, love deeply and wish to maintain and develop, probably appeals many to an older generation. We have a command from the Lord himself to reach all people. So one of the aims in our mission action plan is to attract and retain younger people with children. 
This is a particular challenge for churches which have a strong liturgical and choral tradition. How do we do this while reaching out to parents with children and to do so in a way which does, which does not exclude them, but include them within the activity of worship? Until the pandemic struck in 2020, we ran an all-age Eucharist on the first Sunday of the month, which was consistent with our Anglo-Catholic tradition ethos, and at which children stayed in for the whole of the service. It worked well for school-aged ch children, but it was unfair to expect it to work for babies and toddlers. That was never its intention. Pre-pandemic, we had at least 12 families on our books, but like many churches, we have since lost most of these. However, in the past year or so, we are attracting a number of parents with babies or small children. The Diocesan Children's Advisor will be coming to the PCC in around 11 days' time to help us to explore how we can help grow this area of our mission. Then next, outreach into the community. St Paul's and its members has a long tradition of working in our local community to help meet needs. Thank you to all of you who helped keep this wonderful building open as a place of welcome and ministry to others, to visitors, homeless, refugees. May I add that I was thrilled that members of our church are hosting Ukrainian guests and that we were recently able to organise and host English language classes for our Ukrainian brothers and sisters. St Paul's also continues as the civic host church for much of the civic life of Bedford Borough and County of Bedfordshire with the Lord Lieutenant, High Sheriff and Mayor frequently in attendance. I sometimes suspect that a lot of this civic activity passes under the radar for many in our congregation. But it is a vital and significant part of our ministry and I thank all who help and support this. And this aspect of our ministry has not changed. It's true, however, that some of the landscape has changed over the last few years. Father Luke Lana, our assistant curate and pioneer minister, has been a catalyst for renewed re-engagement of St Paul's with our community. Father has done wonders in community organising in Bedford, and I applaud and thank him for his work. However, Father Luke is set to leave us in a year's time. When Father Luke first arrived here, the first task I gave him, and you'll laugh at this, was I, want you, I said to him, I want you to arrange your exit strategy now. In other words, it's no use having Father Luke here doing his stuff for three years for the contacts, initiatives, work and progress achieved, then to simply run into the sand on his departure. It's essential that this work continues, so he has been setting up a programme which will train up and support those of us who are to carry this work forward, and I will be attending those training sessions, because I need to learn. The training begins next month, and we really do need more people to augment the small band who are prepared to play a part in this important work. So please do speak with him if you would like to explore what's involved. On the wider scale, you might like to know that the Church of England has committed itself to becoming carbon neutral, not by 2050, but by 2030. And if you want to blame anybody for that, you can blame me, because I was one of the people in General Synod who voted for it. It's a really ambitious target. Here at St Paul's, we're doing our best with that. I want to thank Tom Otley for the work that he's doing, uh, and the work he's already done in the churchyard with others really thinking about our carbon neutrality and being green. Not as a political statement, but simply because we need to do it. Moving on for, from our Mission Action Plan, I wish to say a word about our church building. building. I've already thanked those who play a vital role in the maintenance of our largely medieval fabric. We do have two long-standing projects. First, to repair and restore the pinnacles on the south side of the church, which will begin at the end of June with the erection of scaffolding and continue until the end of November. Secondly, that will happen this year, secondly to renovate the North Porch in 2023 as a place of welcome to be crowned with the installation of the medieval statues of Peter and Paul following the receipt of diocesan approval at long last. We have most of the funding in place for much of this work and these two projects must be our future priorities. 
We have also courageously launched an appeal to repair and restore the tower, clock and bells. This project has my full support and I'm concerned that this is a success, so I do ask people to rally around and support that. In conclusion, may I express my sincere thanks to all of you who give so generously in time, energy and skills and money to enable our work of worship, ministry and mission to flourish. So there's much to look back on, isn't there, with thankfulness and gratitude to God. And there is much to look forward to. But we need to be realistic and match our expectations to the resources available. We may sometimes have to accept that we cannot always do everything we would like to, yet still be confident in God's provision for us, his children, and our needs. Finally, thank you for your support of me as your vicar. With its three facing aspects of host to civic life, parish priest, and pastor to our gathered congregation, it is an incredibly demanding and at times exhausting role, but incredibly rewarding. I'm privileged to be here and to share this ministry with exceptionally gifted and hardworking friends and colleagues, for which I thank you all most warmly. May God bless you in all you do for him. Thank you, thank you Father Kevin, for your full and honest and challenging picture of the life of St Paul's over the past year. As we emerge somewhat cautiously from the restrictions of the pandemic years, it has been heartwarming to see St Paul's slowly but surely returning to a fuller life, a rebirth to new life, albeit different in some ways from pre-Covid times as Father Kevin has said. There have been frustrations, but there have been joys too. Frus frustrations that we've been unable to restore fully some of our previous activities, such as catering. Father Kevin has already drawn attention to our need for more volunteers. But joys in the way other things, such as our musical events, have flourished. And more about that later. Alison and I, with Father Kevin, would like to offer our sincere thanks to all those who have worked with such commitment and cheerfulness over this last year. Thank you, Father Kevin, for your leadership and encouragement. We recognise too the quiet work done by our ministerial and pastoral teams. And thank you to Father Luke, who in his short time with us has contributed so much to St Paul's and has worked so enthusiastically for the underprivileged in the wider community. It's so hard to believe that he's already two-thirds of the way through his time here as curate. We're blessed too to have the help of Father Michael, Father Roger and Sister Hazel who are so much a part of our church fellowship. The list of people to thank is long. Our thanks to the PCC lay chair, Wendy Jones and to Sue Gray our safeguarding officer, uh, to David Price, our treasurer, and to those who assist him, to Pat Whittam, our extremely organized and cheerful PCC secretary, and to all members of the PCC who have met by Zoom throughout the year to deal with the important issues of finance and administration. Special thanks from the wardens to our office staff, Robin and Sharon, who look, look after us all so well and deal with numerous queries and requests for help from us all. Thanks to Miriam, our cleaner, the welcomers, sides people, deputy wardens, who help visitors feel at home in our church. Our servers, alas, as Father Kevin noted, seriously depleted in number now for their faithful attendance week by week. Our flower guild, whose flowers this Eastertide were particularly beautiful. Those who serve refreshments on Saturdays, Tuesday lunchtimes, and the bell ringers, who in spite of difficulties ringing bells which are badly in need of restoration, 
ring once more after services. And with Father Kevin too, we thank the small but dedicated team who operate the sound system and live stream. Again, as he said, more volunteers needed. Then there are other people who do the often unnoticed jobs such as litter picking, providing colorful displays of plants in the tubs by the Western North doors. And this is my particular bugbear, cleaning up after the generous and unattractive offerings left by pigeons roosting in our trees. It took me half an hour to clean the mess off my car last week. Fabric matters occupy a great deal of my time and I've already thanked the Fabric Committee and Claire. Please do read the Fabric Report properly if you haven't done so already. To music, music is so important at St Paul's and we would like to add our thanks to those of Father Kevin and to Ian Runnels and the choir for enabling and enhancing our worship in their unique way. We worship with all our senses and how good it has been to have a fuller choral experience again at, at Christmas and Easter. As the hymn writer of Pratt Green wrote, how often making music we have found a new dimension in the world of sound as worship move, moved us to a more profound alleluia. It's also been exciting to see the new series of Tuesday concerts flourish and with a wider variety of art artists from ever, from near and far, a triumph for the organizers, Alison and Claire. The regular Saturday organ recitals have also been a great delight with other events organized by the office staff. Inevitably, there has been some sadness during the year and Alison and I would like to pay tribute to Doreen Smith, a former church warden, and also to Alan Dickinson, a quiet and modest man with a deep Christian faith who did so much for St. Paul's. Both are missed and our thoughts are with their families. Alison and I thank you for electing us for a further year. We look forward to working with Father Kevin and you all, furthering the mission at St. Paul's. In conclusion, this last year, has been tough, but as I said at the beginning, we are emerging and looking forward to new growth and life. In the opening words, the great Easter proclamation, which we heard sung so beautifully at St. Paul's at Easter, rejoice heavenly powers, sing choirs of angels, exalt all creation round God's throne. Jesus Christ our King is risen. Sound the trumpet of salvation. Thank you. Thank you, Florence, indeed, very, very much indeed. And that brings us, friends, to the end of our meeting. So I hope it's time for sherry or something before lunch. for his love for us.